Welcome to another inspirational message from Chowdean Community Church, Gateshead. For more information about Chowdean, visit www.chowdean.org.uk. We hope you enjoy the podcast. So really what I've been thinking of over the last few weeks and what I'm going to come and talk about this morning is is just the unexpected ways that we see God, the unexpected ways that that Jesus can meet with us. I wonder if you came this morning expecting anything. I don't know. I wonder if anything in that song maybe jogged anything in your mind. I wonder where it is that you sense God. The paintings on the fridge By the hand still learning skill Football boots and ballet shoes Lips that kiss away a bruise Morning hair and early eyes With whispered thoughts and knowing smiles The smell of coffee, baking bread Scented roses and words unsaid Draw me to beauty, overwhelming. Tasting eternity in the everyday. Holding on to intangibility and finding grace. Thank you. 
Last time I came here, I wore a dress. And I came a bit of a cropper when they tried to fix the, <laughs> the doobie on, so I got changed this morning. I nearly made the same mistake twice, <laughs> but I didn't. Do you know what? There are two things I find myself saying in our house over and over again. I don't know if there are any other ladies that can identify with this, or even then. Um, I live with my husband and my 11-year-old son, and I seem to find myself saying these two things a lot. The first one is, why does nobody listen to what I've told them when they claim they knew nothing about the thing that I definitely told them about? The thing is, right, where have you looked? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Apparently, I have supernatural powers. Apparently, I know where things are. And people don't even bother to look because they trust in my supernatural powers just to know where everything is. And I don't know whether that's a male-female thing or just in my house. <laughs> but actually, to be fair, sometimes I struggle to find things that are actually in my own bag. It's a little bit like a bottomless pit, and I'll be rummaging around, and my husband will say, you should clean it out. But then I think, well, if everybody would just stop telling me to keep everything for them, then it wouldn't be so bad. Things can be right in front of your eyes, and actually you don't see them sometimes, I find. And, you know, there are glimpses of God everywhere. We've sung about it in a couple of the songs this morning. He's everywhere. And sometimes, maybe Sundays, <laughs> I feel that I'm, I'm awake and I'm alert and I'm tuned in. I'm ready for what the day might bring and I, I'm kind of, you know, tuned into God. Some days better than others. Maybe the Bible's making sense. Maybe I'm having some good, meaningful times when I'm praying and kind of really praying and listening. Not, not just muttering, I do a lot of muttering to God throughout the day, and I think muttering's good, and I think God likes the muttering, but I don't tend to listen a lot when I do the muttering, you know, and I, and I really know the difference when I'm sitting, and I'm being quiet, and I'm waiting, and I'm not just muttering. And it's great when we've got time to think, and time to listen, and time to just be in God's presence, but you know, there's other times when my brain feels like a lump of peas pudding, and I feel like I can sit and I can try and listen and just nothing is getting through. It's like being at the coast when the sea fright comes down. It feels a little bit like that, you know, and I don't always get the glimpses of God that I'd like to see. Sometimes I find it really hard to open my Bible and when I do, sometimes I'm, I'm looking at it and it's, it's like the words are stopping there and they're not really getting in. When I come to church... It does usually help to focus me. I'm usually playing or doing something, so I feel like I, I need to concentrate, and that's good for me. And it's good. It's good to come to church. You know, I've, I've normally got my Bible. I've normally got my notebook. I still like writing things down, even though I've got iPads and things. I, I like pen and paper. Um, and I guess church is one of those places where I feel ready and expecting, waiting for God to maybe say something, maybe for, for, for something to kind of hit home and for a penny to drop. And that's really good, you know, small groups, church, maybe prayer partners, whatever we do, you know, it's, it's good to have those places and those times when we're focused and we're kind of thinking, yes, God, I've got my notebook, I'm ready, I'm ready to take it. Whether it's a digital one or a metaphorical one or a, an actual notebook, I'm ready. <coughs> but the thing is with Jesus, I've been looking at some bits going back through the Gospels, and I've noticed that actually he meets us sometimes in really unexpected ways, in really unexpected places, and at times where we wouldn't necessarily be looking for it, or even ready for it, and it would be so easy to miss, and I think I've probably missed Jesus wanting to meet with me many times, just because it's unexpected and I'm not looking. And so I guess that's what I want to look at this morning. I'm going to look at just three little instances where Jesus meets with people in unexpected ways, in unexpected places, and just share a couple of the thoughts, really, that I felt that, that I got from looking at those passages. Um, Jesus started his ministry at the age of 30, didn't he? And the, the Bible says that at first people called him rabbi, which meant a teacher. And it was going to take time for, for the penny to drop and for the disciples to click. Actually, he's not just a teacher, he's something more. This is the Son of God. And eventually they get there, but it takes them a little while. And Jesus is really patient with them. 
And so sometimes Jesus, when you read the Bible, you see he's, he's in the synagogue and he's, he's teaching and he's opening up the scriptures. Or, you know, it's like the Sermon on the Mount. He's talking to a group of people and he's, he's teaching and he's talking to them about what God is like. He's opening that up to them. And there's great crowds that come and follow and they listen and he, he heals people and he speaks into their lives and it's amazing. But in the second chapter of, of John's gospel, we see Jesus, he's out with his family and his friends. They're at a wedding in Cana in Galilee. And I've got a wonderful mental picture when I, when I read this story. In my head, it's a little bit like Ruby Weddings at the social club, that kind of thing where, you know, you've got the full mix of families. You've got the, the kids getting on their knees on the floor and dubious dance moves from older members of the family sometimes as the music plays. But we'll, we'll read some of the verses, see what happens in this story. It says, on the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. Dear woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, my time has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. So that's quite, that's quite a capacity. <laughs> Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He didn't realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and he said, everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. This, the first of his miraculous signs, Jesus performed at Cana in Galilee. He thus revealed his glory and his disciples put their faith in him. Now, I know that story is a sermon in itself. Each of the little passages we'll look at, you could, you could have a separate sermon on all of them. So I'm not going to try and unpick the whole thing. I just want to reflect just on, on the effect of encountering Jesus at this wedding with family and friends, a social occasion, so there would have been joy and celebration and there's food and there's wine and there's laughter and there'll be dancing and all sorts of things going on, probably people you haven't seen for a long time, if it's anything like our celebrations. And Jesus is just there as a guest. It's really early on in his ministry. He's there as a guest with his family and his friends. Nobody's invited him because they want to see a miracle because he hasn't done any yet because this is his first one. They've just invited him because he's Jesus, he's Mary's son, and this is the family getting together. But out of all of the people there at this point, probably his mother is the one person who really knows who he is because she, she I mean, an angel told her, so she had a, a good heads up many years before. And I love it because he's the first person that she thinks of when there's a problem. And it makes me smile because... The problem wasn't that there was a healing or somebody had, you know, collapsed. They'd run out of wine. They'd run out of wine. It's such a practical problem, but it would ruin a wedding, wouldn't it? You know, if all the food went and only half the people had been fed, it, it would spoil the day, wouldn't it? And she knew that her son could do anything. And my little gran, bless her, she was a bit the same with me dad, if you know me dad, any of you. He was her only son, and she thought he could do anything. So anything went wrong in the house, I'll just ring your dad. Anything wrong with anybody in the family, um, I told them to give your dad a ring. And I'm not sure that my dad was always overly pleased that he got the phone calls. He still gets phone calls from people at 76 to, to sort things out. And I kind of imagine, you know, when, when Jesus said, dear, dear mother, it's almost like, oh, ma'am. Man, you can imagine if he was a Geordie, it might have been that kind of, it's not the right time, ma'am. But she was just so confident 
that Jesus could meet the practical need. That he, he should just, this is my son, he will sort it out. And so we see Jesus, he meets a very practical need, and it's during a time of great joy. And interestingly, there's not really any mention of the bride and groom in this story, other than the master goes to the bride and groom and said, why have you kept the best wine until the end? And so actually, they were probably blissfully unaware that the wine had run out, blissfully unaware that the servants are having to fill up the water jars with water. And the master of the banquet didn't know what had happened either. He just thought that the best wine had been kept. But the servants knew. And so did the disciples. And the result of all of this, of this miracle that actually on the, on the face of it seems a bit, I don't know, not superficial, but almost unnecessary. Do you know what I mean? The last little verse that we read said the result was that the disciples put their faith in him. Jesus had met a really practical need, and they got a glimpse of his glory. And sometimes I think Jesus meets us in really, really practical ways. And sometimes we'll maybe look, I don't know, I think I might be guilty of maybe looking for something that's a bit more deeply spiritual, when it's actually every, everything spiritual when God's in our lives, isn't it? And I wonder how many times I've missed encountering Jesus in a time of great joy, in a time of great celebration. Because sometimes when things are going well, I don't know, are we prompted a bit less to pray sometimes? I think I am. But he's there. I, I, I think sometimes I wonder if I've been carried away sometimes with what's, what, just what's been going on, maybe like the bride and the groom in this story. Even in the times of blessing, God's got more for us. Even in the times of great joy, Jesus has got things that he can do and we can catch extra glimpses of his glory and his goodness. And it's the opportunity for faith to grow, isn't it? Jesus meets us in our times of deepest joy. And then two chapters further on in John's Gospel, there's another really unexpected encounter with Jesus, and I love this one. And again, you could have multiple sermons coming off this one. This one takes place in Samaria. Samaria. It's where Jewish people live, but they were seen by kind of Jerusalem Jews as second class. Not as good. They didn't tend to mix, which is why the story of the Good Samaritan would have had a real double edge to it, wouldn't it, in the day. So Jesus is traveling through Samaria on his way back to Galilee. He's on foot, so he's, you know, it's hot, he's walking, he's dusty. The disciples go ahead to find some food in the town, and he stops to rest next to an ancient well in the heat of the day. The Samaritan woman comes to draw some water from the well, and Jesus does what, it, what we would look on and say, well, that's the most natural thing in the world, asks her for a drink. Can I have some water? Can you draw me some water? But it's, it's revolutionary, absolutely. She didn't know who Jesus was, but... She knew that he shouldn't be talking to her. She was a woman, and she was a Samaritan, and there are two excellent reasons in first-century Jewish culture why Jesus just shouldn't be talking. I'd love to go into just what Jesus does and the way he treats women, but that's not what it is about. It's another time. But the talk, Jesus sits with her and the talk, and she's probably utterly amazed by this utterly flabbergasted but she doesn't retreat she doesn't run away and she doesn't close up she has a conversation and he starts just talking about water the next will well and he's thirsty and she's come to draw some water out and that's just what he starts talking to her about just where she is just what what is going on in her life right there and he starts talking about the water and then he relates it to himself and he starts with something very, very ordinary. And then somehow they're in the middle of talking about something really deeply spiritual. And so we'll pick it up from verse 13 of chapter 4. Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, Go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. 
Jesus said to her, you're right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have had five husbands and the man you now live with isn't your husband. What you have said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see you are a prophet. So, just put, she's starting to realize there is something special about this man and he knows things about her. And Jesus then goes on in the passage and he starts to talk about worship, things of the heart, the kind of heart that God is looking for. And he's addressing not just the fact that, you know, she, she's a woman and she's had this checkered past, but also the fact that she's not second class. In God's eyes, those, you know, the Samaritans may be treated differently by those other Jews, but actually God is after people who will worship him in spirit and in truth. And he's about the heart. And the penny starts to drop just a little bit more. And this next little bit, I almost think like she's, she's just putting out some feelers. It's clicking something in her mind. She says, I know that the Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. And Jesus declared, I who speak to you am he. And then the woman forgets all about her water jar leaves it next to the well and she goes straight into the town and she tells people about Jesus and she says, could this be the Christ? It's another unexpected encounter. Someone just going about their normal business day to day. But do you know what? She probably felt utterly weighed down because this lady must have some baggage in her life, mustn't she? Apart from whatever she might have felt about the way that women were treated or about being treated like a second-class citizen, you don't get onto your sixth relationship with five divorces behind you without having some hurt and some pain and some baggage. And do you know what? I've read this passage loads of times, and I think I used to always assume that she was a, I don't know, a, a loose woman or something like that. But actually, understanding a bit more about Jewish culture at the time, it's more likely that she's just been cast aside again and again and again because it was so easy to just cast her wife aside then. She probably had zero self-worth. And yet here is a Jewish rabbi, someone she recognizes as a prophet, and then could he be the Christ? Just talk, he's talking to her. And it's not just passing the time of day, he's talking about deep things that matter. The nature of God. And something about this encounter with Jesus opened her up. She was really brave, she was honest with him. She didn't try to cover over what her life was and where she was at. She didn't hide the fact that she didn't have a husband. And again, she gets a glimpse of who Jesus is. And she's told a wonderful truth that it doesn't matter one little bit when it comes to true worship, that you might be this or that, or you've had this in your past. God's looking at what's going on in our hearts. And we don't know much about what happens in our life after this, but do you know what? It had the potential to absolutely transform her. And I know that for me, it can be really difficult to hear the words of Jesus and to meet with him when I'm feeling rubbish about myself, when I'm weighed down, when I'm just in a heavy place and things are weighing heavy on me. But there Jesus is, and he might be there as I'm um, doing the dishes or pit, picking up the socks for the millionth time off the floor to put them in the washing bin and feeling I'm so unappreciated or whatever it might be. He's there, isn't he? He's there in the everyday. And I guess the result of meeting with Jesus in these times should be to make us forget about the mundane, to leave the water jar and to be filled with wonder and explore with others who he is what he's done, and to be reminded that we are worth something in him. Jesus meets us with all our baggage in the mundane routines of our everyday life. And then finally, tucked away right at the end of Luke's gospel, we often look at this pa passage at Easter time, we find Jesus meeting people in a time of deep grief and sorrow. And again, it's really unexpected. It's not a gentle conversation with tissues and a cup of tea and some nice biscuits. It's not a, an official counselling session. This is a long walk on the way from Jerusalem to a town called Emmaus, which was another local town. And these two people are deeply sorrowful, deeply grieved because they knew Jesus and they are absolutely heartbroken that he's died. 
all of a sudden, as these two friends are walking, Jesus joins them. Like that is one of those sudden appearances in the Bible where we don't know where he's come from. He's just appeared supernaturally. And he just joins in their conversation, just slips in. And this is, I think it's one of the most ironic conversations in the whole of the Bible because the conversation is about him. It's about his death and how they're feeling, how sad they are, how upset they are. And actually, he's walking alongside with them where they're talking about how sad he is that he's died and he's there. And they just don't notice it because he's not expected. And they've just seen him die on a cross and be buried. So I guess they can be forgiven for not expecting to see him walking with them. So here are a few verses from Luke 24. And so as part of the conversation, he asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. And one of them named Cleopas asked him, are you only a visitor to Jerusalem and do not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things? He asked. Well, of course he knows but he wants to draw it out of them. About Jesus of Nazareth, they reply. And Jesus just lets them talk. He lets them express their grief and their anger and their bewilderment. And then he says, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. And so they reach the village, the small town, and they they still haven't clicked who Jesus is, but they want more of him, they want more of his presence. And they say, "Will will you stay and eat with us? So he does. And then it's as he breaks the bread, they realize who he is. And then quick as a flash, he vanishes from their sight. And then they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up, I love this, they're shattered, they've just got to the village, but they got up and they returned at once to Jerusalem because they had to tell people, had to tell people. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, it's true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. It's a wonderful story to unpack, but I think one of, one of the main things that it says to me is that Jesus can be walking right alongside with us in our times of deepest sorrow, and we don't even realize it. A little bit like the footprint poem that a lot of people like. He was there, but they didn't expect him to be, and so they just didn't see it. And Jesus was really patient with them. He allowed them to express what they were feeling and, and just talk out all of the angst, and then they were ready, and he could step in, and he could talk to them. And you know, I I, I believe he's the same for us, that in the darkest times he's there, he's walking, and sometimes we just can't see it, but the, the key surely is to keep pouring out our hearts to him, just keep that dialogue going, because, you know, we're connecting with him, aren't we? We're talking, just pour it out, whatever it is, just keep talking, and we'll see that eventually you come to a place where you can then receive what Jesus is going to say to us. And the penny drops, and we can see him, and we realize that he's been there all the time. An unexpected presence in the most difficult of times. And so I think I've been, I've been learning as I've been going back through the Gospels that he's, Jesus is there in unexpected ways in our times of deepest joy, in practical ways, in the everyday routine in the times of great sorrow, do we recognize him? Or do we just not see him because we're not expecting him? Have we got eyes to see? A couple of years ago, the Methodist church um, in the building where we meet, um, the congregation decided to fold because there weren't very many of them. And most of the the people who were there were, were older ladies in their 80s and 90s, and they just felt it was just too much for them to, to kind of carry on the church. And it's been such a blessing. A lot of them decided they wanted to join, join with us. And I guess our style of worship and ways of doing things were very different from what they'd been used to. And it's been wonderful getting to know them and hear a little bit about their journeys of faith. Um, 
And there's, there's one of them, I've, I mean, I love, I love them all, I've got to say, but there's one of them who's she's called Joyce, and she's a bit of a tinker, my gran would say. She's about 86, I think, um, and she's got a mischievous glint in her eye. And she's a Sunderland fan. And me and our family, we're kind of, I've converted John to Newcastle from Middlesbrough, but we're definitely black and white rather than red and white. And when I would be walking to Bill Key's school with Daniel... Every Thursday morning, she would be walking the opposite way to go to, was I think they called it Knitting Natter or something at church. And she would always have something cheeky to say to Daniel about the football. And if Sunderland were doing better than Newcastle, she would have a, an extra mischievous glint in her eye and, and, and have a little bit of a banter with him before he got to school. She sometimes nearly made us late, actually. Um, but anyway, Joyce had a fall just over a year ago, and it's, it's knocked her, and you know, she's, got, she's had a very bad back, and she's not been well, and there was a good few weeks where she just couldn't get out of the house to come to church. And I'd rung her up a couple of times and chatted to her on the phone, and then one night I thought, you know what, I, I, I just want to pop in to see her. And I'd knocked at the door before, but I'd never actually been in the house. So I, I, I kind of tootled along the road and gave a knock, and I said, Joyce, I've just popped in for an hour just for a chat, and I kind of, I, I didn't quite know what to expect, because I'd never had a really long, in-depth conversation with her, and we sat down in the living room, and the hour went like that, and we talked about everything, we talked about her childhood, we talked about church, we talked about what it's been like for her getting used to our services at church, and, and we talked about faith, and, um, and at the end, we just, we had a little moment of prayer, and there are times, I guess, when you can sense the presence of Jesus really, really strongly, so much that you can almost feel like you could reach out and just, just touch. And sitting in that living room, just with my hand on Joyce's, I felt like that. We just had a few moments of prayer, I prayed, and she prayed, and then we were just quiet. And I was incredibly moved and I went home and I wept and I still fell up. And it was a good few months ago now because Jesus was there in that room so powerfully and I wasn't expecting it. I'd gone along thinking, oh, I've got work to do. I've got things I need to be doing. I'll, I'll not be long and then I'll be straight back. Do you know what? I could have stayed. I could have stayed another hour. It was a wonderful, holy moment. And... Uh, I guess I would just like us to think, really, when was our last holy moment? When did we last have that sense of Jesus being there so you could almost put your hand out and touch him? The path begins Talking in the twilight Sharing stories With faith and dreams And memories woven in It felt just like a holy moment With significance suspended in So Oh, 
flickers suspended in the air. Its unexpected presence made the meaning more profound. It was a holy moment shared. The hour passed, I could have stayed. The hands were clasped and then we prayed. Lord Jesus, thank you for the different ways that you, you meet with us. And maybe we've thought there of different holy moments that we've had. <clears throat> Times when we've absolutely been utterly convinced that you're there with us. Lord Jesus, help us to, to recognize you more. Help us not to, to limit where we expect to meet you. In our times of deepest joy, Lord Jesus, I pray that we would be aware that you're there and you have more for us. In the everyday, with the mundane things, Lord, and sometimes with the things that weigh heavy on our shoulders, I pray that we would have an awareness of who we are in you, how much we are worth, that you lift us up. You can expose the things of our hearts, but you don't condemn he shows a better way to be. He shows the hearts that your Father in heaven is, is longing for. And in our times of deep sorrow, Lord Jesus, may we have eyes to see that you are there walking alongside of us. I pray that we wouldn't stop talking to you, even if it's pouring out angst and bewilderment and all the different emotions that are there often in those times. Let us have eyes to see and ears to hear, oh Lord Jesus. I pray for more holy moments in our lives. Amen. This is the end of this message. We hope you enjoyed it. If you want to find out more about our church, please visit www.chowdean.org.uk and please take a minute to rate our podcast on iTunes.